Yeah, you do Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here with us this afternoon. My name is Janet Hoder, and I'm head of communications for CGIR's Systems Transformation Science Group. It's my pleasure to be here to moderate today's session. Um, during the session, we're going to be focusing on water in food systems um, and exploring synergies and trade-offs between water and food and nutrition security. Climate change impacts are resulting in growing pressure uh, to balance the demand of water for production and water for consumption, especially in water stressed areas. Weather extremes such as drought, floods, rising sea levels and increased soil salinity are all feeding into this pressure. Today, we have a panel of experts who will try to unpack the linkages of water for food and nutrition security. They will delve into innovative solutions and learnings underpinned by research to foster new ideas and adaptation strategies that can strengthen water and nutrition security. Um, the structure of our program today will be a series of short presentations, um, and then our pres presenters will turn into our panelists. We'll welcome them back up to the stage to engage in a, in a discussion, and then hopefully we'll have time for some Q&A with you all um, at the end of the hour. Um, so without further ado, um, allow me to introduce um, our first presenter, Andre Hajar. Andre is the CEO of Go Baladi, a Lebanese company specializing in dairy goat production. His experience and knowledge in production and supply chains will provide valuable insights and examples into operationalizing the water, food, and nutrition security nexus, as well as informing us on the social impact of his work. Andre. Thank you for the introduction. All right. So I have a question for you. Uh, how many of you tried goat cheese before? Oh, we have, have, we have plenty here. Or how many of you considered to replace their cow cheese with a, with a goat cheese? All right, cool. A little bit, not really. All right. So, uh, let me tell you a little bit about us. So uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, GoBelady, a Lebanese company started back in 2015. And our vision at GoBelady is to really promote goat dairy as a healthier alternative for cow dairy. A little bit about the past. You know, goat dairy has been here for thousands of years. Now, with the industrialization, so the cow farming took over and cow dairy is all over and all of us became accustomed and used to cow dairy. Nowadays, I'm telling you something interesting. Goat dairy is coming back and it's coming back because people are shifting from cow dairy 
to go daily because of the healthy aspect of them. The second is like go daily is easier to adjust. And lastly, it's more sustainable. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story in Lebanon. You know, Lebanon have been through a tremendous economic, banking, financial crisis on top to add the energy crisis worldwide and the increase in prices of animal feed and crop globally. So what happened to us is that when we started, we started to take the milk from the farmers on top of the mountains in, in the Lebanese mountains. And these are small scale farmers, family farms who have their own flock. And then we take their milk and process it at the dairy and we sell it in Lebanon and in export countries in the UAE, in Africa. So when we started, we had a, a very heavy cost. But then when I want to tell you, when we had the crisis come over, we realized that, you know, working more sustainable with small scale family farms was a competitive advantage for us. With the increase of price of energy, with the increase of the price of feed, our price of milk, which is coming from the shepherds on top of the mountains, was, was very comparable to the industrial farming practices. We are now part also of the V4F program, Water and Energy for Food. And they helped us a lot through several TAs to work on several challenges we faced, starting from the cash flow management to the financial management we have, the cash gaps, also, they helped us in the energy audit. So with the energy crisis, the energy cost of food, uh, instead of being 8 to 10%, it became 40%. And here, so we needed more support, more experts to come in to help us reduce our energy costs, install more solar, use more renewable energy, reduce our CO2 emissions. And lastly, we needed to promote more the health aspects of growth among the consumer. And then also V4F stepped in with their experts and helped us in promoting more sustainability aspects. So what I want to say about this, about our story, about our experience, that sustainability, which seems uh, uh, at the beginning expensive, will be for you in crisis time a competitive advantage because you're reducing the use of water. I mean, the goats consume less cow to produce a one liter of milk in water. Do you reduce the use of feed? Of, uh, of imports. It's like the goats are on the in the mountains, like free range all day long. So it's a lot of advantage. What seems to be very expensive and more sustainable is really a pure benefit at the end. This is a little bit about our story in, at Go Beledi. And we look forward for you to adopt more goat and to use more uh, goat dairy and replace it Replace the cow dairy as much as you can because really it's healthier for you. It's easier to adjust and you will be helping shepherds and small scale farms improve their livelihood and uh, make them more resilient in this uh, stressful environment and in all these economic challenges and world challenges we're facing. Also, remember one thing that goat farming is, is more sustainable to the healthy planet and they consume, we consume less water and less energy compared to cow. So all these elements are key to more sustainable business and more sustainable uh, value, uh, supply chain uh, for us. Thank you. And thank you. I hope I was on time. That's Good. great. That was perfect. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is um, Professor Edeltraud Gunther, um, an re internationally renowned economist and expert in environmental accounting. With more than 30 years of experience in interdisciplinary research teams and more than 200 published journal articles, Professor Gunther has a unique focus on av of analyzing environmental resource management from a business perspective. As director of UN and UNU Flores, she strives to bridge the chasm between science and decision making to promote her research <laughs> resource nexus approach. Sorry, <laughs> to environmental resource management and sustainability. She's also the representative for UNU to the United Nations Environmental Management Group. Now that I have thoroughly bungled through that, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. So if uh, you say that I have 30 years of experience, that also tells me a story that I'm getting old right now. But therefore, actually, is there the, I don't know, no, that's not, 
my slides. Uh, hmm. I would need my presentation. So maybe while we are setting this up, just, uh, yeah, but that's not the first slide. So yes, wonderful. So this was quick. Thank you so much. So the where's the camera actually for the online uh, participants? Great that uh, many of you participate, I hope, without creating flight nest. Um, so the focus of, of the work of our institute is the resource nexus. And I would like uh, just to give you a highlight on resource nexus in agri-food supply chain and how we advance uh, resilient food systems and how we do this with doctoral students. Um, so when we speak of the resource nexus, we look at different components. You see the resource nexus in the in the center. We look at soil, we look at biota, so fauna, flora, at water, climate, uh, also space. For example, we look at topics like vertical farming, uh, material, and then the other topics around like food based on as a resource, based on soil, on water, uh, on plants, like biodiversity, ecosystems, waste or energy. And in all our projects, we always take this resource nexus lens. And I think that can also be interesting for our discussion, because that also means that students have to be trained in a different way. We really have to restructure our programs to create this awareness for the resource nexus. And I would just like to present you three examples of research projects in uh, of students. Uh, of a cohort of students who, who delve into this topic of the resource nexus in agri-food supply chain. One topic is on uh, Iran and looking there at uh, the study's focus is how to decentralize and develop uh, nature-based solutions with citizen science. That's also uh, an interesting research approach and uh, develop um, evapotranspiration tanks. Okay, and we have a discussion later on, so therefore just a few highlights. Second one is in Colombia, where we look at uh, primary production, but then all the stakeholders around. And the question is, how can urban and very urban uh, agriculture uh, enhance uh, so the socioeconomic uh, components, where we then work with farmers, uh, look into in their development perspectives. So that is then more socioeconomic orientation. And finally, so first was more technical, more socioeconomic, and now comes the um, more science perspective. We also look at primary production and then the question how uh, uh, urban agriculture can mitigate or um, adapt to climate change. We always approach this, and this is already my last slide, uh, these uh, research questions with different questions. Uh, regarding the resource nexus. So first question, why do we need a resource nexus approach? Because um, uh, the different resources are interconnected and very often if we only have a focus on one area, we have trade-offs, we have negative effects on other areas. This is what we then uh, look at. Then also people who are involved. So it's not only about the systems, it's decision makers, it's consumers. We have to convince them, we have to work with them, we have to take in consideration their own needs. Um, so when uh, is, is the question, uh, do we do this now for the future? Long-term perspective is, for, is often a, a huge challenge, um, especially uh, in, in more fragile communities. Then uh, also the question, how, uh, how able are we to think in terms of a nexus? Interconnectivity is complex and then decisions must be made now. And so how do we balance, uh, how do we balance that? And, um, and then the, the question, how do we use this resource nexus approach? How do we do this? We could say, simplified, we use this as a checklist that we always say, okay, this is a goal for one research, but what might be an impact on another uh, resource? And my experience that if you really make it presented in such a simple way, then you also can get a discussion started. Then also this, it's then like cause uh, effect relations uh, that can then uh, be easily discussed. And then the next step, of course, logically is um, that uh, we look into the drivers. So first understanding 
the interconnectivity and then the question where can uh, policy makers, where can farmers then, then also have an, an influence and where can then really all the resources feed into decision-making processes on the farm level, on the consumer level, on the production level of of um, of uh, machines, for example, and then all those uh, components come together. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, and um, the, I really appreciated the perspective about you know starting thinking about very deliberately with students and training in new ways. Um, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Revi Hawara, um, who works for the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, or UPRSAT, as director for the Africa program. Revi has over 15 years of strategic leadership in R4D in international organizations. She has a demonstrated track record of applying scientifically proven agricultural technologies and innovations that enable agri-food systems to, provide, uh, to produce nutritious food, increase household resilience, and conserve natural resources. Over to you. Thank you. So, as uh, my colleague has said, uh, from Equisant, uh, we are part of the CTIR. Okay. So, as Equisant, uh, we are focusing on where. Uh, Island agroecologies, where our mission is to our mission is to really make sure that these uh, dryland agroecologies are productive, bringing food, nutrition, security, and resilience. Uh, we work across Asia and Africa. Our headquarters is in India, and we have several locations in Africa. Uh, the agroecology, it's huge. We are talking about 55 countries with an area of 2.5 uh, square kilometers. We are specialized in crops that are adaptable to these dry land agroecologies, nutritious, and resilience. You're talking of sorghum, millets, uh, that are loaded with micronutrients, even the parallels that most of you are familiar with. These are cereals that will actually bring you the nourishment from low glycemic index, which is health, healthier, for managing some of the non communicable diseases like diabetes, for example. Carbon uh, free, most of the younger generation. And then we also bring in grain legumes. These are loaded with protein. So if you look at them, they are really smart crops that can make people live longer, if I may say so. In fact, this year, the UN has declared it as the International Year of Millets. I hope you know that. And if you have not tested millets, you have to test it before the end of this year. Talking about the resilience when it comes to issues of water and soil, I have a couple of innovations that Equisat and partners have brought. For example, this is in Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is mostly highlands and they have these flood waters, and we have dropped these uh, water spreading units that are able to locate the source of the floods and be able to spread the water. Controlling the erosion and also uh, being able to contain the water and recharge the water table. And this has brought in actually elements of crop diversification. Beyond the cereals, farmers are able to grow vegetables in between forage for livestock. As you can see the pictures here, that in these places you can be able to actually control the erosion, uh, close the gullies and be able to actually regenerate uh, the agroecologies. And it's small scale smart irrigation. Again, this is an innovation uh, that we have uh, developed uh, and it's been actually, you know, uh, tested and adapted in Southern Africa. It's a two-pronged 
approach for irrigation, and it uses uh, instruments which we call chameleon and full stop uh, with uh, sensors that is able to inform farmers when there is an experience of moisture spread so that they irrigate. At the same time, it also senses the amount of nutrients in the soil and be able to say, don't add more nutrients to avoid leaching, which is actually ending pollution of the environment. With this, we have seen that farmers have increased productivity because we are working with them not just to produce, but also to link them on the innovative platform, link them to an output market. So, yes, you know, increments of productivity from 28 to 300%, and of course, similar increment in income. This particular innovation was recognized by the Excellence in Practice, which was awarded in 2022, a number of partners, including Asia. The last innovation is on this uh, regenerative a landscape approach. This is in India, in the central landscapes. Again, we use a landscape approach where you map out the landscape, you look at the soil, the water, all the biophysical elements and the socioeconomic, and you start overlaying a number of uh, technologies uh, from improving soil, water. And from this, we have seen again instruments uh, in farmers. As I mentioned, water table. Uh, also, we are seeing that even the emissions coming from these has actually uh, gone down. Uh, this is a technology that we have used on a larger scale. As you can see, we are talking of 100,000 uh, hectares that have been regenerated. And again, this was awarded in Mahatma in 2020 for biodiversity conservation for using regenerative landscape. I want to say that again, ICRIS, that we are proud that the work that we are doing in this trial and agroecologies in 2021, we are recognized and given the Africa Food Prize. Thank you. Thank you. And, and between goat cheese and millets, I feel like we're all being challenged to consider expanding our dietary diversities. But our final presentation will come from Charity Ose Amponsa, um, a researcher on governance institutions and inclusions with the International Water Management Institute, IMI. She has over 10 years of experience in conducting research for development, facilitating multi-stakeholder knowledge sharing and learning on thematic areas of general trans gender transformation, sorry, governance and institutional capacity, strengthening to enhance climate resilience building of water, food, and land systems. Parity. Thank you so much. So I think that uh, we will move now to um, households and to bring uh, some gender perspective into the discussion. So basically we are talking about climate change, we are talking about a climate crisis, and from my perspective, of course, in this perspective, the climate crisis is a water crisis. And this water crisis, as we all know, limits food production. And therefore, if we are looking at food and nutrition security issues, then it's more of a water uh, agenda that we need to discuss here. Now, looking at everything that has been said, the water crisis from this particular uh, presentation I want to make, it's more of a gender issue. And gender, today I want to focus on the feminine side. So I talk more about women and women not as a homogeneous group, but heterogeneous group. Even though for the purposes of time, I would uh, try to look at them as women. So you can see the crisis over there in the pictures. There's water scarcity. This is tomato, which is supposed to be yielding a lot, but we have a lot of drying of, of the fruit. And of course, this is affecting nutrition. I break an example from the northern part of Ghana from a typical household. Now, with the water crisis, the water scarcity, 
this is causing a lot of issues in the context of low adaptation or adaptive capacity for women. We see a lot of changes or social transformation in the household in that men are moving into producing more of what we normally would call women's crop. For example, garnets has been mentioned. Garnets used to be something that is really produced by women, but now it has economic value. So there's a lot of contract farming around granites and soya bean. And so men are now producing a lot of that and women are redrawing. And it also needs a lot of inputs, which women are not able to afford. So it's pushing them to go into dry season farming. Of course, with uh, a lot of irrigation around that, whether from a well or from a dam, it's also good for nutrition for the household because now they are able to get vegetables, of course, to sell some in the market, as you see up there, and to use some for household nutrition. The other side of the story is migration. With the water scarcity, we have a lot of the men and the boys in the community moving to southern Ghana and leaving household food decisions to women and also farming to most women. So again, that is a good thing because then they decide on what type of nutrition to give to the household, mainly children and older uh, family members that are left behind. Now there is also the uh, diversification of food production. So now a lot of women are also moving into livestock and they can do the little ones. So like chicken and fowl, but the bigger ones like the cattle, it's still maintained by men. This is a good thing. We are getting protein from the little uh, chicken and guinea fowls they are able to raise. Some are also adding on non-farm enterprises, like selling little things, food around the household. Now, again, there is the issue of um, overburdening the women with labor because the boys are no longer there. Women have to go long distances to look for water and to be able to assess that water which is already scarce is another issue. What should we be doing? I think we should be rethinking the this research, this innovation, and the partnerships that we are having around the food and nutrition security issues. I think the main thing uh, is that we really need to understand these complexities. As I said, I try to talk women because we don't have time, but women are not just women. We have the woman who is not educated, woman who does not have enough social capital, the woman who is not able to access even the water resource. So we have different categories and it's important that we understand these complexities to be able to come up with the right type of innovation for the specific uh, people who are vulnerable in some specific contact. Of course, with our uh, innovations, it should be something that is building agency for these women and also uh, building the institutional capacity to support the type of innovations that we are producing from the CGRR, even from EPSAD, from UMI, and our policies. How are we going about this? They have to be really transformative. We also need uh, the people to participate in that decision making. We, of course, have to build functional and effective partnerships that will support all these uh, innovations that are coming up. And we need to catalyze investment to ensure that we push these women because they are doing so well. They are being left behind. They are still taking care of the household. But in all these, whether it's research, it's innovation, it's partnership, there should be equity. There should be equity. So that's the photo there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, with those snapshots of this incredible work that's being done by our, our presenters, I'm now pleased to invite them to come up and become our panel so that we can continue the discussion. And while they do that, I um, am pleased to be able to introduce you to our, um, our panel moderator, um, Shakuntala Harang Singh Thilstead director of the CGIR Nutrition, Health, and Food Security Impact Area Platform and 2021 World Food Prize Laureate. 
for groundbreaking research, critical insights, and landmark innovations in developing holistic, nutrition-sensitive approaches to aquatic food systems were well recognized and adopted by governments, policymakers, and stakeholders for strategic implementation to transform food systems. She's also chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub and co-chair of the Eat Lancet 2.0 Commission. Shakuntala, I turn moderation over to you. Hello. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the four presenters. It was really very interesting and um, for the panel discussion that we are going to have now. And especially Professor Edel Traug, you talked about the resource nexus. Um, understanding the resource nexus, and we heard from Charity at last talking about women and gender and the different and the different parts of the system. But I'll stick in our discussion now to mainly focus on, wa on water and water within the holistic system. So we heard yesterday that the UAA pledged 150 million in new funding for water security solutions in fragile and vulnerable communities. We've heard about fragile and vulnerable communities. Reflection on the pledge and how will that influence the work you do, be it research or production systems? And how will it affect, for example, supply chains in the work that you do? You can start. Sound with me? Yes. All right. So, um, as you're saying, so. Uh, Water is uh, a very critical part um, uh, for, uh, I would say, in rural areas. And for us, since we supply the milk from shepherds on top of the mountains, uh, having like uh, accessible accessible water in a in a sustainable uh, way is very critical for these farms and for these shepherds. Um, and uh, a fund like uh, this, like uh, the, the one pledged by the UAE, it will be crucial to help these uh, communities improve their livelihood, uh, figure out ways, uh, innovative ways that are simple, that can uh, help these family farms and shepherds on top of the mountains uh, have access to water, uh, clean water for, uh, for them, for the, for the flock, um, in a way that is, uh, I would say environmental friendly, and that will have a big impact on the livelihood of the farmers, of the shepherds, and uh, uh, on us, uh, and it will improve our supply chain as a as a producer, as a producer, because uh, having access to water is crucial for these uh, shepherds and, and for these uh, family farms to be able to rem to remain in their land. Yes, I can see from your from the example you gave close connection there is to the water and the water supplies. Charity, I want to go to you because you gave us some good examples of women in agriculture and how they had to move their production systems to, to other systems. What, what can you tell us? How do you see this pledge going to affect what they are doing? Okay. Thank you so much. So I, I think the pledge is in the good direction. This is money that is going to help with a lot of research. Yes, I agree. We already have tools. We have innovations. We have a lot of um, smart agriculture systems that are there, but we still need research. We still need to understand the context-specific challenges of communities. I mean, food production and even nutrition, it's more of a local thing, at least from our developing country perspective. So, this will build a lot of capacity also. We need capacity at the institutional level to be able to help people to bring up a understanding of value chains that will be able to promote not just food for household consumption, but also open up 
better market systems for these rural people. And that will also trickle down to the urban areas because if the food is produced in the rural areas, we need better distribution uh, value chains and systems that will bring the food to everybody. And by that, we are creating accessibility and also moving more towards uh, sustainability for food security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charity. And it should I want to give you the next question to get your first response. The COP28 water agenda has three thematic priority areas, freshwater ecosystems, urban water resilience, and water resilience food systems. And this is the first time for many that there's the recognition of the importance of water for holistic food systems. What kinds of barriers and limitations must we dismantle in order that the pledges and the commitments can reach to those most in need. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, and uh, especially thank you for this question because very often we uh, initiate uh, new programs and then we think, oh, there is uh, there are concepts, there are even financial resources, and then things don't happen. And therefore, I think uh, looking into barriers from the outset is really crucial. And we uh, now accompany all our research with barrier research, uh, because you, um, when things don't happen, then we uh, very often come to the conclusion, oh, we need a new program. But maybe we don't need a new program. We just have to implement it in a different way. So what are barriers from our um, from our research? Of course, uh, financial resources are very often a barrier, but uh, now you mentioned already this pledge. We also have many good examples where financial resources are not barriers. And another important barrier is the knowledge, really training, raising awareness first, but then also training. What does this, does this mean? And there also the nexus comes into the game that it's not only about water, but it's, of course, it's about water. But I always say it's the entry point into this nexus thinking because everything is interconnected and you also have to integrate long term thinking. That's also often, uh, uh, often a, a barrier that uh, decision making is very often short term. And of course, you have to think uh, of your food for the next day. So it's also normal that you cannot think long term if you do not have nothing to eat for the next day. But time, time perspective is, is very often also a, a barrier. And, um, and uh, a fourth barrier is uh, the interplay between the different actors that they really then have to come together. They have to understand. I also liked your examples of goat cheese and uh, millet because it's, it's also a, a consumption decision. What do we eat? And very often we are not aware, we just talk about taste and availability, but we, and again, this is a nexus uh, uh, approach. We have also to create awareness of the, uh, of the long-term perspectives and of the interconnectedness. Um, and uh, this is then again, uh, knowledge creation. So I would say uh, knowledge is a very important uh, driver also for implementing this, uh, this agenda. Thank you so much. And I was talking to my colleagues that we from the CGIR, since we work with research, we decided to come with you because we hear that you have lots of students who work in this area. And it just we have. And I already saw that uh, many are online, therefore I look yes. at my cell phone. So and greetings would, to our doctors, students uh, out there. And if it would be great if we can get some of them to work with us in the CGIR system. Thank That's you a great so much. Offer. Chari, um, Robbie, I would like you to start with this question that I have. Projections show that 1.8 billion people will be facing water insecurity by 2025. And this is further exacerbated, as we know, by climate, health, and conflict. When faced with such circumstances, the most vulnerable, including women and young children, and the easily displaced people, they suffer most. How then can we ensure that the demand for water in food and nutrition security are equitable and just? 
leaving no one behind. Thank you. Such a difficult question. And uh, um, as Ikri said, I'm very familiar with the conflicts uh, that are taking place because, as I said, we work in dry land agroecologies. And uh, those of you who know Africa well, we are actually talking about 60% of uh, the agroecology being dry. And the Sahel is basically the hot spot where we see a lot of these conflicts, which is essentially coming in because of or the pressure that is this is exerting on the resources. So yeah, to the question, um, I think for me, uh, we are in this era where we are having a lot of uh, you know challenges with water, but I also want to mention that I think we are also seeing the predictions that have been made in terms of the drier areas experiencing some wetter periods. So we are seeing this cyclic of floods and droughts. Uh, places like Mali, we never, ex you know, in Niger, we have experienced floods uh, in the last say, couple of years. For me, I think we really need to be very clever and start applying the type of innovations, uh, some of them which I've highlighted, which is how do we take that flash flood water and be able to keep it within the landscape? because it's really an opportunity where we are seeing crop diversification, because typically people grow one crop in a year. But when we take this water and we trap it, it's giving an opportunity for growing more than one crop. We are seeing vegetables coming in the landscape. We are seeing that this is a place for growing fodder for livestock. That's nutrition, that's uh, income, and that's the kind of things that we need to be bringing. And she said something, we need to look at this foresighted. We need to bring more and more climate information. We need to be able to see, like today, I think the African Union, they talk about the African Union 2063 agenda. We need to be looking at that uh, time horizon and be able to advise what sort of crops can actually do well. We are able to, we should be able to predict even the water, where to put irrigation, because I think these are the instruments that we need. So when you hear that there are pledges that are being made, I think let's seize the moment and start bringing these kind of instruments, even in the hands of policymakers. Thank you so much. And it's really good to see that you can talk both of that there are advantages, but there are trade-offs in what we do. And also the timeline perspective, as many of you have mentioned, is extremely important. I have one last question, which I would like to pose to you. And this stems from my own work. Um, I work with food-based strategies and I work with holistic food systems. And when I look at water, I see quite a focus on water dealing with food production systems and not so much dealing with water for consumption and water that's needed with respect to food-based dietary guidelines. And all countries are using food-based dietary guidelines as a means of coming further and ensuring that all their citizens can be well-nourished and that in a, in a sustainable manner. So I'd like to ask the question that how can we use this as a quick win? What would we do to have a greater inclusion of water in food-based dietary guidelines? Not just for drinking, clean water for drinking, but you also need water for cleaning the ingredients that you cook and you prepare. You need water for cleaning the utensils. And very importantly, you need water for washing hands when you prepare foods. But, so what can... What are some easy entry points that we can use at national level with respect to making sure that our food-based dietary guidelines also include important aspects of water? Who would like to take that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So I will even start off from the local level before we get to the national level, because most times when we, we are at the national level, 
then how it trickles down becomes a, a bit scattered and then we don't find the implementation action on the ground. So I believe that at the local level, the governance of water bodies and also water resources, I should say, is very, very important. Like you said, there are so many conflicting claims for the water. It's not even just uh, those that you've mentioned, but also for uh, headers, people who bring animals from other communities, even other countries into, let's say in my country, Ghana, we have a lot of animals coming maybe from Mali, from Burkina Faso. So what should happen is that we should have very uh, effective uh, management and governance of the water resources that we have within the community level so that uh, everybody have just an equitable usage of it and it's well managed. Even if it is uh, water that we are storing from rain, we should have clear guidelines and it should be used for the purposes for which we all agree to. So I think that is one thing. Then at the higher level, at the national level, we should have clear guidelines because we have different sources of the water and most times it's not used appropriately. So we are focusing more on production. Even with the production, you again, the conflict comes in because you have animals moving and walking through the water and destroying the water. At the same time, other people go to fetch the water to drink or to bring to the house to cook food. People go there, they bath in the water. So these types of confusion and uh, complexity, we need a system or guideline that helps us to be so clear. Maybe this particular water source in the community must be used for drinking only, and the other one we could use for the animals. That type of thing is really not there, at least from where I come from. And I think going forward, it, it's important. But most importantly also, the people within communities, they have their own rules, they have their own norms, values, meanings that helps them to manage and govern this system. It's just that sometimes we bring in a lot of national level things to confuse these localized rules and they, they do not really function, but they have their own local knowledge and they know how to manage these water bodies. So if we cannot help them, then we should not confuse them. Yeah, we should let them use their own means to govern these water bodies. For example, in some areas they will say, okay, on Tuesdays, we don't go to the stream. There's a reason for that. We want to conserve, right? So then we accept, but then we come in and we say, oh, but it's nothing. People need their water. Let them go there every day to fetch their water. You know, this type of thing. So we need to be very clear and we need to find a way of um, coordinating and also harmonizing the local knowledge and the scientific one and also the national laws and the local uh, laws or whatever, the norms at the local level. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, just quickly two points. So, uh, you know, we are a producer of, of, of cheese. And then uh, it's very important, the point you're bringing about not only the water you consume to, to drink, but the water you use uh, to produce the food, you know. And I believe this is an important point. And for us as a producer, we know that you need X liters of water to produce uh, X kilograms of cheese. And uh, as a producer, it's, uh, it's very important for us uh, first of all, like uh, like what we did is to uh, do water reuse and water filtering so and reuse. So in the process of production, uh, after we complete the production, so we filter the water and then we reuse it for the next batch of, of, of production. And that's very important to reduce water use uh, in the food preparation, I would say. Uh, the other aspect is to use processes and technology at the production floor that will help you reduce the water consumption to produce the cheese. And here you have to make investments in technology and in machinery and in processes uh, to help reduce the water use in the, in, in the food uh, production itself or food preparation, I would say. Uh, but coming from production perspective, uh, this is, I, would, uh, I would say this is the, the way how we should look at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, just a quick one. I think uh, I'm probably going to be biased. I'm a soil scientist. So we have done a lot of work on soil nutrient balance. We tell you in this particular landscape, you have so much going in and so much going out. 
and they are now operating in a deficit. I think we need to have that kind of knowledge for water everywhere. And it has to come to the household level. To reading about so much cubic uh, liters of water, is uh, my grandmother in the village having that knowledge? Perhaps not. So we need to filter that knowledge to that level so that when they are drawing and they are you know, washing dishes and so on and so forth, they should know that this is a very scarce resource. And that's why now we can start saying, where do we make it now to be a place where it becomes productive for kitchen gardens? The next point I want to make is the crop varieties. I think we need more and more water efficient varieties. I'm glad the millets that I talked about, we have, for example, pea millet that can actually, you harvest in within 60 days. And if you look at the amount of water, if you compare with most of the cereals, this is quite significant in terms of saving the water. And of course, the smart water technologies that are able to sense when to irrigate and when not to irrigate. So I think these are the instruments that we need to have more and more in this discussion. Thank you so much. And Elitra, you talked a lot about knowledge. Yes. One here mentioned the importance of knowledge in wanting to move forward with the water and the issues that we face with water. So, yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, so uh, I just would like to build on what uh, you already said. I really think it's important uh, to value water. We talk about water. If it's too much, we have a flood. If it's uh, less, uh, too less, it's a drought. Or if it's dirty, you also mentioned. Uh, mentioned this. So uh, I think actually we have to start very early in preschool already that we create this awareness. And this is an easy start. So children really understand water quite well. This is nothing complex for a child. And uh, they have contact to water every day. And even what you explained with soil, uh, also really uh, comparing humid soil and dry soil, I think. And then it's already, there is also research, if you really grow up with knowledge, then you value water in a different way. And then, of course, all the things you mentioned, like the technology, data, what you mentioned, is very important. But then you also need to need to train people to interpret the data. So I would uh, really conclude with its knowledge from preschool on, or maybe even once uh, the, the parents uh, talk to the children about water. And then uh, also, um, yeah, uh, bringing it up through school, then to universities and then to the uh, political arena. It's all about knowledge. <laughs> I'd like to thank my four panelists for a wonderful discussion and for taking on the questions and the discussions that we that that I brought forward and also into taking into consideration the deliberations that are happening here with COP28. Janet, may I give over to you and see if we can have a few questions from the audience? Thank you um, to our panelists and also to, to our audience. And we would like to take a few minutes and open to questions. Um, maybe we can start some of that discussion here and then we can continue it out in the, uh, the gathering area once um, the sessions come to a close. So um, I'd like to invite any questions from the audience. We can get you a microphone just so that our folks listening online are able to hear you as well. And it works? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Hello, I'm Jacob van Sonder from the Netherlands. Um, I found your presentation uh, extremely helpful, very inspiring. Um, one of the um, uh, activities I'm working on in the Middle East and North Africa is on water scarcity. And in this whole green transition we're facing, the countries in this region, the MENA region, but, uh, but I lived in Mali as well, and so I, I, I know what, what the situation is there as well. The trade-offs have to be made. Uh, what we see in many countries um, is, first of all, a lot of subsidies on water, no taxation, which means that water is not valued in a correct manner, so a, a lot of water loss. Um, and secondly, that a lot of water is being used in the agricultural sector, which, um, and forgive me, uh, Andre, but the agricultural sector is not so very competitive in most of the countries which I'm working with. 
uh, for example, in Jordan, 70% of the water is going to agriculture. Agriculture is contributing roughly 3.8% to GDP. So that's not much. Um, couldn't we spend the water better? So how, in, from a helicopter view, do you think we should address those trade-offs which need to happen? Can we just tell your grandmother from now on, for every liter of water you're using, you have to pay a tax to the government? Or should we tell to farmers, no irrigation anymore, only uh, um, irrigation by, by, by drop, um, drip irrigation? Or what should we do to make sure that also for future, there is still water available in those very arid regions? How, how are we going to deal with that? I, I would love to hear from you how this green transition can be nurtured in a way that we have a just transition so that not your grandmother has to pay that $1 per liter, but perhaps somebody in the city should pay a bit more in order that everybody pays his share. I have to answer because it's, it's talking about the grandmother that I've so uh, I don't think we need to introduce taxation at this point. Uh, we are talking of people like in case of Africa, you know, places like you have mentioned, people who are already living on less than one dollar a day. For me, as I mentioned, that you see that most of the countries, even where it's dry, we are getting the water some point in the eastern part this year is El Nino there is water but I can say that water is just passing by we need to put that water into use as I said where we have harnessed this water we have seen crop diversification they grow sorghum millets and then they bring in chickpeas that improves the soil through biological nitrogen fixation the second crop when they bring in vegetables, the income from that, I believe it can make a difference. Problem we have is that we are still with the same cropping season, I mean, system, one crop per year, and when water comes, we don't see a lot of efforts. So I think starting from the top, we really need to look at this water seriously. Most of the African countries, as I said, there's been a lot of discussions around soil and fertilizer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is good, but soil alone cannot do the trick. We need soil and water to work together. So all this information and knowledge, we need to bring it so that we can be able to have, like in most of the countries, like where you're coming from in the West, it's not just one crop per season they grow more than three crops in a year. Uh, you have the crop cover and the income coming from there. So not yet taxation, but I think we have enough knowledge that we can actually make this water productive. Yeah, so, so maybe from, uh, from my perspective, really uh, collecting data or using data that is there. So really going with very site-specific approaches. That is what we very often learn that what is good for one farm might not be good for another. Uh, and then again, uh, working with this data and from the government, so again, training and then from the government really regulations, if there is really what you mentioned, water loss, um, sometimes regulation really helps depending, of course, on uh, in the situation. And what you mentioned uh, is also that uh, scenarios, this long-term thinking might help that uh, people are prepared, okay, if there is this situation, then I can do this. So then, okay, and then I know now we have this situation, I go left, we have this situation, I go right. So also making it then, then simple and not too complicated, but then people are prepared and then it's like a boilerplate. You then just can say, I go in this direction or go in that direction. So a combination, a nexus of a suggestion, but still I think we, we also need clear rules. Uh, that is uh, very often also a good starting point. I would like to add a point here. Uh, and it's really uh, related to consumer behavior. 
So, uh, for example, if you tell the consumer, uh, so make more awareness on the consumer behavior that they need to be more aware of the water consumption and the water needed to produce these sort of products or this, this food that they're going to consume. Let's say, for example, when you talk about uh, goat dairy and cow dairy, for example, it takes one liter of uh, water for a goat to produce one liter of milk. But for the cow, it takes four liters of water to produce one liter of milk. So obviously, you, we need to inject more in the marketing and in the consumer behavior. They need to understand that, okay, if we buy this product, so we're saving on water resources. We, we, you know, I think this is very important and that, that requires a lot of effort on the consumer behavior side. We have uh, come to time and I know that our next session will be ready to take over the, the space in just a moment. So um, I, Shakuntal, I don't know if you'd like to come in and close out with any last thoughts. No, thank you. But I'm, I'm really happy you brought in that um, point about consumer behavior and also this about, so we would combine consumer behavior with what Edwin Truth talks about, about knowledge, knowledge that starts at home and at preschool. With that combination, we can have a force that drives the use of water and the multiple uses of water and the, and the knowledge about the benefits of water. So I do think that's a good combination. Thank you, Shakuntala, and thank you again to all of our panelists and to our audience here and online. Certainly one, uh, one theme that I think we'll all take away other than goat cheese and the millet um, is, uh, is really like the importance that. of knowledge on both the consumer and the producer side. And, and um, certainly as food systems and agriculture have, have really come onto the agenda and in gatherings like this, we, we have new opportunities um, to do the same for recognizing the importance of these issues. So thank you all. <laughs>